Thank you, Amy. And I see we have over 100 people today looking for cash flow. So let's find some. I'll kick us off. I'm the principal in charge of fixed asset services. I'll hand it over to Joe Sawatsky. He'll talk a little bit about 179D and 45L and other energy incentives. Then he'll hand it off to Jim Donovan. And Jim will talk about ERC, the employee retention credit. And then Joe Stoddard, partner in charge of R&D, will wrap it up with just that research and development. And then we'll do breakout sessions. And at the end of this general session, we'll introduce um, those who will go to the breakouts. So first, to get to know fixed asset services, get to know the team that are implementing some of these deductions and credits. So in general, we advise on and implement tax and energy saving strategies for taxpayers who are acquiring, building, renovating, and designing tangible property. Those clients that are on right now that we've had this talk um, in the past, you might not have seen the energy side of that or the designing side of that. And so we're getting a team together that can handle some of those uh, incentives as well. And we'll, Joe Sawatsky is going to dig into those more. Uh, our team, uh, a motley crew of CPAs and professional engineers and energy modelers, lead professionals. The point being that we get credits and deductions in the built environment all in house. And the reason for this team and building this team within I Bailey is in large part due to Congress inventing incentives for those who are building and acquiring and renovating. And this wave of incentives started eight years ago in 2014 when the tangible property regulations came out where you can expense certain items that you might be capitalizing for work purposes, also known as the repair regs. That hasn't gone away. And it's something that every year taxpayers should look at to get cash flow. Then in 17, the Ta Tax Cut of Jobs Act came around and gave us 100% bonus that we're still in today um, for anything that's 20 year recovery period or less. In 19, the appropriations bill was signed and 179D and 45L was attached to that and 179D got made permanent. Uh, the CARES Act, they gave more stuff. So if you're renovating or improving property, you could potentially get 100% bonus. And then in 22, we're still waiting to see what they do with the Build Back Better or see if they split off and do something separate or segmented. But the point of this slide is there's always something. Okay, so at FAS, our services are built around the whole life cycle of the building. What you're looking at here is zero to five to 15 to 30 years of a building life cycle and what incentives kind of fall into place at any given time. When you build or purchase something, cost segregation, it's been around in modern form since 1995. It's something that a lot of you on the phone have done. Um, Energy incentives, picking up a little bit as well from the build purchase point of view. When you get to that five to 15 year, that's where you can start having fun with repair studies, partial dispositions, QIP. And then going all the way around to 30 years is where you're doing some major renovations and really digging in to uh, those partial dispositions and starting the cycle all over again with cost segregation. So when you're looking for cash flow from your building portfolio, you don't stop once you do a cost seg at the acquisition or building. You look for things throughout the life cycle of your building year in and year out that Congress has incentivized for you. So the basics. We're going to cover really hard 179D, 45L, and I have a partial disposition example because those are some of the oddballs that get missed. And we're gonna talk very briefly, just one slide on these three things. So cost segregation accelerates depreciation for certain building components. Building components is the key word there. The example I like to give is the computer example. 
So we're all looking at a computer right now. And we all know for the most part, computers are a five-year property and you get that deduction all on year one. What a cost segregation does is it looks at what that computer is plugged into, the outlet, takes the wiring and conduit in the walls and the circuit breaker that's turning on and off in the panel board, that computer, for tax purposes, it's the same tax life as that computer in five years. So it's that example times 100 others that add up to about 20 to 30% of the building components an acquisition or a new building can be accelerated deduction in year one. And that's cost segregation. Now, qualified improvement property is a deduction of non-structural interior property that is approved. This came out in that TCGAA. We are finding that if you are renovating property, 60 to 80% of that building cost is qualifying for QIP 100% bonus deduction. It really is a game changer for those that do a lot of renovations or are maintaining their buildings. Then the repair and maintenance. That's been around since 14 in its final form. It's a tax expense for building components that do not qualify as an improvement. So you may on your books capitalize, say, a roof. Uh, you changed out a roof membrane, but for tax purposes, depending on the facts and circumstances of that project, what kind of membrane did you change it to? Did you touch any decking with that roof project? Potentially, this, that roof can be an expense. So it's that and a hundred other facts and circumstances on your improvements and renovations where you might get an expense right off the bat. And so let's, let's go on to the next one. The partial disposition election. This is one that I would say most taxpayers forget about because it's easy to forget about because it gets embedded into your fixed asset ledger. What it is, it's an election made by doing it. You just have to do it and you elect into it. It goes on form 4797. If it is elected, then any demolition cost associated with the project can be expensed in the current tax year, but you have to do the form 4797 first to get that. And here's where taxpayers miss it because it has to be recognized in the year of disposition. So after the year of disposition, you can't go back and get that deduction. It is lost. So let's look at the example. In this case, taxpayer purchases a warehouse, $5 million in 15 and 21, they replace the lighting, some renovation of the office, all in for about a million. And they determine that of that 5 million purchase price, 300,000 of it was disposed. You can do that through engineering, reasonable engineering practices. So what you're able to do is deduct that 300 from the original basis. It was in this example, resulting in a $260,000 deduction. And because you took that deduction, you're going to get $50,000 as an expense for the removal cost and the demo of that project. So this is something, a cash flow item that needs to be served every year when you're renovating and improving. I would say anything over $250,000 has to be strongly considered for this in that tax year. So from a planning perspective, when can we do these things? So we just talked about partial dispositions. You can't retroactively go back. Fortunately, for cost segregation, repairs and maintenance, if you ever need cash flow, look at your fixed asset ledger. Scrub it, assess it, and retroactively grab those deductions that all go into year one, no amending, on your Form 3115. Now, the easiest way to get the deductions and credits is just seamlessly on your current year and put that on Form 4562. But some years, you don't need the deductions and so they get missed and that's okay. You can go back retroactively. Or you can be super proactive and we don't see a ton of that, but when we do, it shows well. But looking at your CIP and start to plan for all the incentives that Congress is coming out with or thinking about coming out with so you can plan and maximize your incentives. From a software point of view, we're talking a lot about credits and deductions. One thing to monetize that and to capture that 
It's another thing entirely to implement it into your system and to be able to use it properly. So tracking, implementing, organizing the data in the software system, and then organizing it in such a way that you can identify opportunities when new legislation comes out. So you can pick those out and grab those deductions and, and so they're not hidden and not missed. And here's a, one case study I'm gonna do. And looking at it, if you're looking ahead, it, it is a unicorn. We, we don't have many like this. This might be, might be the only one. Most of our projects are within a million to 10 million. But I wanted to show this one because this is a good example of looking at something holistically, not just, hey, I gotta do a cost seg or I gotta do a 179D. Um, but at, in the end, it's all deductions and credits looking at it all together. So we have a $50 million renovation of a two and seven story building. It was renovated historic building and a small commercial building as well. And all in was about 400,000 square feet of stuff. So of course we got approached to do the cost segregation. We did that found $5 million deduction, but on that two story portion, we found a $400,000 credit. On the seven story portion, we found a $108,000 179D deduction, and then a $7 million credit to boot from a historical tax plan. That credit is federal and state. And then a qualified improvement property on that commercial building. So really a unicorn, but a good example of, you gotta look at your projects, your portfolio holistically, and then come with a game plan because these things can be combined. It's not one or the other. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. And thank you, everybody, for spending a little time with us today. Um, like Mark mentioned, my name is Joe Swatsky. I work in the Minneapolis office here at Ide Bailey in the Energy Incentives Department. So we're going to spend uh, 10, 15 minutes here talking about two energy efficiency programs, uh, specifically the Section 45L uh, tax credit, which Mark just mentioned, as well as the 179D Energy Efficient Commercial Building Tax Deduction. So 15 second uh, kind of commercial here, <clears throat> excuse me, Mark mentioned we're in the fixed asset services group, kind of a motley, motley crew of professional engineers, HERS raters, architects, engineers and the like. And so what kind of our unfair competitive advantage here, specifically the two tax products we're gonna talk about in a minute, require energy modeling and profession and professional engineering expertise, in addition to the traditional, you know, accounting and implementation piece. And so what I Bailey has done is built out this energy efficiency uh, practice with the professional engineers and energy modelers, and kind of makes it a real seamless integration. So we're able to realize the credits and deductions and as well as work with our tax folks to get them in, implemented in a timely fashion. Fantastic. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is the section 45L energy energy efficient home credit. And what that is, it's a $2,000 per qualifying unit tax credit for both uh, single family home builders, as well as owners and developers of low rise uh, multifamily buildings. Now these multifamily buildings need to be three stories or less above grade. Um, anything taller than that, we get into 179D, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, and so the qualification requirements is you need to demonstrate an energy efficiency over some baseline, right? And in this case, the baseline is the IECC 2006 standard. So you need to demonstrate a 50% or greater energy efficiency over uh, that baseline with a fifth of that energy savings coming from the building up. So the certification process includes uh, modeling the subject building versus that 2006 reference home uh, using IRS and Department of Energy approved softwares. There's about a half a dozen of them out there. Um, here you can see a screenshot of REM rate, which is one of the more popular uh, programs out there. We'll use REM rate typically as well as Echo Chope are kind of our two big ones, but there are other, uh, other utilities out there that we utilize from time to time. At the end of the day, the tax credit needs to be certified by a qualified individual. So the qualified individual in this case is a HERS rater who is uh, either certified by ResNet or an equivalent rating network. And obviously we have uh, those folks on our staff. Once you're able to 
qualify for the tax credit, the implementation is really quite easy. Here you can see form 8908. And all you do is you take the number of qualifying units, multiply that by 2000, that product drops to the, uh, to the bottom line and flows to the, to the tax, uh, tax return. So in terms of targeted efficiencies, obviously there are different energy efficiency requirements based on climate zone, um, as well as IECC versions. Um, so the if you, good way to think of it, I'm up in Minneapolis here, the heating and cooling requirements are quite a bit different than Las Vegas, right? And so we've put together, Kristen Gustafson and our team put together this great little utility that incorporates kind of our targeted efficiencies. So if you're ever interested in saying, you know, gosh, I don't know if we're gonna get over that, uh, that hurdle or not, uh, we'll be able to, create one of these documents for you based on your know, project's location, climate zone, and the like, and kind of give you the targeted efficiencies for each one of these, uh, for each one of these, uh, these buildings. I'm not to say that they'll definitely qualify or definitely won't qualify if we don't fall in those ranges, but it's a good place to start. So some key takeaways here, as I mentioned, $2,000 uh, per unit, low-rise multifamily as well as single family. You're able to go back uh, to an open tax year, so uh, typically 2018 through 2021. So anything first occupied in those tax years could potentially qualify. The legislation is pending, which will extend this uh, extend this tax credit either in the Build Back Better or some other version. So right now your opportunities are 2018 through New Year New Year's of 2021, and we'll just have to see what happens. Um, in terms of uh, the extension. All right, let's take a quick look here at the section 179D, energy efficient commercial building tax deduction. It's a variation in the theme of the uh, 45L. You need to demonstrate some energy efficiencies. In this case, it's based on the ASHRAE 98.1 standard as opposed to the IECC. And there's three categories, building envelope, the mechanicals and interior lighting. And assuming you're able to uh, demonstrate those energy efficiencies, there's a deduction of up to a dollar per 80 square foot for building owners as well as designers. We're going to talk about in a second. So a couple quick case studies. We won't go through the gory details, but there you can see at the bottom these are real world examples, all anonymized. Um, 611,000 uh, square foot manufacturing facility yield uh, about a 1.1 million dollar deduction. And here at distribution center, same idea. So. Mark mentioned, you know, kind of pulling levers and, you know, maximizing deductions. Typically, we will do these 179D studies, it, typically in conjunction with the cost seg. If, if one is in the mood for the deductions, this is just one more lever to pull. The good news is you can go back to anything uh, renovated or constructed as of 2006, and the implementation is really quite simple. It's form uh, 3115, change 152. So kind of the more interesting opportunity on the 179D is uh, $1.80 per square foot deduction for designers of governmentally owned buildings. And so if you think about it, you know, obviously governmental, governmentally owned buildings or entities don't pay taxes in, in some traditional sense. And so $1.80 per, $1 per square foot deduction is more or less meaningless to them. So there's a provision that allows uh, them to assign the deduction to a designer. And so you can see there an example or the definition of a designer. So really what you need to do is have played a role in creating the technical specifications for one of those three building components, lighting, mechanical, or envelope. What we don't like to see is that last bullet there, that last quote. If you're merely installing a repair and maintaining uh, the, the property, then you do not fall in the, in the designer status and it will be inappropriate for you to uh, obtain that deduction. Couple quick case studies here, which we'll dig in more in breakout sessions, but there you can see a mechanical retrofit, a perfect uh, example of, perfect example of a dollar eighty per square foot deduction for in this case, a mechanical engineering firm. And here you can see some additional examples. So really any governmentally owned building will qualify with some few exceptions. And here you can see just a kind of a tax planning tool that we went through for an architectural firm. Um, at the end of the day, they were able to generate about a two point, just over a $2 million deduction there. So allocation letter. Uh, for these governmentally owned projects, uh, an allocation letter is required. 
And you can see it kind of an example there. And all of those pieces of information, including the under penalties of perjury, I declare statement at the bottom, but that's required. And that's executed by a representative of the governmental entity, as well as a representative of the designing firm. And so I saw on the um, registrant list, quite a few folks from governmental entities. Just throw it out there, if anybody has any questions on, you know, is this appropriate to issue this allocation letter to so-and-so, we're more than happy to walk you through it or even help implement your 179D um, uh, deduction program. So at the end of the day on the governmental side, uh, we're looking for designers who work with governmental entities. And again, this, these governmental entities are really all the way from the you know, federal level all the way down to the state and county uh, levels as well. And then uh, in, in order to claim the deduction, it needs to be placed in service. The building needs to be placed in service in an open tax year, typically the last three similar to 45L. And uh, it, also similar to 45L is in claiming deductions in prior years, amended returns are required. Um, otherwise, typically we just catch you out and just go year after year. And obviously one needs the desire for deductions. Oops. So key takeaways there, $1.80 per square foot deduction on privately owned buildings. You can go all the way back to 2006 and capture the deduction in your current year tax return. Governmentally owned buildings, assuming you meet the designer's status, placed in an open tax year, typically going back to 2018. And then because the deduction is on a per square foot basis, obviously the bigger, the better. Uh, there's some fixed overhead costs in terms of site visits, which are required. And so you kind of have to do a cost benefit analysis and looking at these studies of, um, you know, if it's a very small facility in the middle of nowhere by the time one gets out and does, uh, does the site visit and might eat up all of your benefits. Awesome. Well, thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. Let me just make sure I have control of the screen here. All right, my name is Jim Donovan. I'm a partner with our credits and incentives group and I lead our employee retention credit team here at I Bailey. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys today. Um, I'm gonna outline the benefit of the employee retention credit as we're talking about cash, right? Um, and the ERC is certainly a way that uh, you can have a significant cash infusion into your organization. So let's hop into it and we'll start with the basics here. So this crazy COVID pandemic happened in 2020, and we, we always get new law. Um, the, the government can be pretty reactive, right? So we had the CARES Act that came out in March of 2020, and the headliner was the PPP loan. Um, it's, it's free money, right? And so a lot of people overlooked the employee retention credit, and rightfully so. Um, at the time, PPP and ERC were mutually exclusive. So, you know, if you're taking PPP, why do I need to worry about ERC, right? Um, well, well, we'll get into that, but, uh, you know, let's, let's talk about what the credit was worth in 2020. So it is a refundable credit and it's basically 50% of qualified wages. Um, and it's up to a maximum credit of $5,000 per employee. So if you're doing math at home, we just need $10,000 of qualified wages um, per employee and you can max out your, your employee retention credit. Um, you do need to be an eligible employer um, and that you can be a large employer or an eligible small employer. If you have 100 or less full-time employees in 2019, that's kind of our base period for ERC. Um, if you meet that 100 or less full-time, it's not full-time equivalent, it's actually a calculation you do, um, you can take the employee retention credit on everybody. Uh, fantastic deal, right? If you are over that 100 employee threshold, you can only take the credit on those being paid but not providing services. Really what we're looking for here is individuals you paid to sit at home or for load employees. Um, so the benefit's substantially less. You also need to be qualified via a reduction in gross receipts, um, or you're subject to a government order. So basically in 2020, we had a ton of government orders in place, right? 
that basically said, hey, you can't perform your business operations. You need to work at home, um, which, which works for a software company, right? But the reality is if you're a physical therapy office um, and you can't have people come in, you're subject to a government order. Um, you, you can't perform your operations. So that was one way to qualify, right? If you, you had this government order that shut you down, um, there is a more than nominal test. It has to impact you in a, in a way that's more than nominal. Um, or the bright line way to qualify is if you had a significant decline in gross receipts. And this is on a quarterly basis. So basically you'd compare a Q2 of 2020 versus Q2 of 2019. If you met that decline, uh, you qualified for the credit for the entire quarter. Uh, if you qualify under a government order, you qualify while the government order is in effect. So if it runs from, you know, elective surgeries were shut down from late March through early, you know, or late April, early May. Um, if you're a, a company that provides that type of service and you can't do it, then that's the period you would qualify for. Um, tax exempt and nonprofits could also qualify for the ERC in 2020. And it was originally set to expire at the end of 2020. Um, and again, I, I mentioned it was mutually exclusive with PPP and it's fully refundable and it's claimed on form 941X. All right, so those are the basics. Now, I, you know, you forward, fast forward to the end of 2020 and early 21, and you have a flurry of law that extends and expands the ERC. So we have three new bills. Um, we'll start with the Consolidated Appropriations Act. So this is in late December of 2020. Basically, it makes it retroactive that you can take a PPP loan and ERC. So now we have all these companies saying, gosh, did I qualify for ERC in 2020? You should definitely go back and look because even if you took a PPP loan, you can still take ERC. Now we can't take the same wages for ERC as we took for PPP forgiveness, but in 2020, we have basically a nine month window um, where we may be able to identify eligible periods around the PPP loan that you qualify for ERC and then maximize that benefit. We also had the American Rescue Plan Act that came out in March of 21. And basically this extended the credit um, into Q3 and Q4. And sorry, I should mention the, the CAA also extended the credit into 21 for, for Q1 and Q2. Um, then we have the Recover or the Rescue Plan Act, which extends it for an additional two quarters. They also give us the recovery startup business rules and the severely financially distressed rules. So recovery startup business, this is a big deal, right? Um, you can take a credit of up to $50,000 in Q3 and Q4 for wages paid if your business began after February 15th of 2020. Um, so again, if your business started after that and it's again, a true startup, uh, this is something to look into. There are a lot of other rules around it, but uh, it could be a big benefit for your company. Severely financially distressed, that's only available for Q3. Um, it's basically companies that were basically at, you know, 10% of gross receipts in 2019. Um, they're just really, really hurt by the, the pandemic. Um, and, and there's some additional rules there, but uh, it could be a lucrative, um, lucrative credit for you because it removes the, the employee threshold, whether you're a small or large business. All right. So let's talk about the credit in 21. So I mentioned there's an expansion and extension of the credit. And the credit's now in play for Q1, Q2, and Q3 of 2021. Why don't I mention Q4? Well, we have the Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act, um, which was signed by the president in November of 21. And what it did is it used the ERC as a pay for. So what we have is the, the president basically sunset the ERC uh, at the conclusion of Q3 in 2021. So it takes one quarter off the book, off the books. Now the startup rules are still in effect. So the startup, if you're a startup company, an eligible startup company, you can still take ERC for Q3 and Q4. Now I mentioned an expansion of the credit. So in 2020, this credit was 50% of qualified wa wages. Well, in 2021, the credit rate moves to 70%. So now you're getting a, a much better benefit, um, still a max of $10,000 in wages. It's also computed on a quarterly basis. 
So in 2020, we have basically that nine month period to max out your ERC. Now you can max out your ERC on a quarterly basis. And we have some examples later um, that kind of identify or show the, you know, what that credit could look like. It also raises the employee threshold from 100 to 500. So you remember in the basic slide, I talk about, gosh, you're a small employer if you're at 100 or fewer in full-time employees in 2019. Now that number is 500, so you can take the ERC on everybody. Um, if you're over that 500 mark, you're back to only taking the ERC on basically furloughed employees or employees you're paying to stay at home and not work. Um, it can be a sizable credit, right? If you have 150 employees and you're maxing out each period, um, you can do some math at home and it's, it's a really sizable credit. You can't double dip though. Again, we have PPP2 in play in 21. Um, there's also some other benefits that you may take advantage of like the family's first credit, work opportunity, FMLA, there's other employment credits. We can't take the same wages for ERC that you're using for those, those other credits. So don't double dip there. Um, there is the ability to work around those PPP loans, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Do know that the rules vary quite a bit for 20, um, 2020 versus 2021. Um, so again, I recommend you work with your tax advisor when you start digging into this. Um, we get a lot of questions around qualification. They're applying different rules to different periods. I'm like, that only applies to 21 versus 20. So uh, again, you know, four sets of law here um, and, and a lot of different rules. There is an expansion that we do have some governmental entities that can qualify in 2021. So state colleges, universities, um, hospitals, basically if your primary purpose is healthcare um, you, and you're a governmental entity, you can qualify for ERC. Tax exempt nonprofits are still eligible. And we, we finally got our first set of guidance in March of 21. Um, we got notice 21-20, also 21-23 which provided us with that more than nominal test. So basically when you qualify under a government order, like I said, there's some additional hurdles you have to clear uh, to make sure you're an eligible employer. And so this guidance finally came out in 21. All right, now let's talk about qualification in 21 because like I mentioned, it's a little bit different. Um, it's actually easier to qualify. So we still have the, you know, if you have a government order in place, you can still qualify. Uh, mainly we're seeing restaurants qualify due to government orders in 21, um, at least early 21. For the most part in 21, we're seeing people use the other method. They're qualifying under a gross receipts test. And in 2020, we needed that greater than 50% decline in gross receipts versus the same calendar quarter in 2019 to qualify, right? Um, that's a pretty high hurdle. Uh, a lot of our companies have fantastic management in place. They're able to pivot um, and they were pretty darn successful. So what the government said or what the government put forth in these bills that expanded the, the credit is they said, hey, now you just have to have more than a 20% reduction in gross receipts versus that same quarter in 2019. Again, 2019 is always our base period. We're always comparing to the quote unquote, last normal year. Um, so if you meet this test, again, you qualify for that quarter. Not only that, most of the time, if you meet the, the test for a quarter, you will qualify for the next quarter as well. Um, they applied or added this alternate quarter um, section in the law. So basically, let's say you meet the gross receipts test in Q1 of 2021 versus Q1 of 2019. You're met you're down more than 20% gross receipts. Um, if that's the case, you qualify for Q1. Q2 stands on its own. You're not gonna meet the test, gosh, we're 85% of gross receipts in Q2 of 2019. But I can look back to Q1, and if I qualified for Q1, I qualify for Q2. Now in Q3, um, if you're still at 85% of gross receipts in 21 um, versus Q3 of 2019, you're not gonna qualify. You can only look back one period. So um, you would need to qualify on Q3. Um, 
So again, a nice expansion of the law there and something to take advantage of. A lot of our clients are, are really excited when they're like, hey, we only met the, the revenue test in one quarter. Um, but I said, hey, you know what? Because of that, you're, you're going to qualify for two. It also works that if you meet the test in Q4 of 2020 versus 2019, you automatically qualify for Q1. So again, a, a little, little benefit there. All right. This last slide is basically a uh, other nice things to know slide. Um, so basically, I did talk about interplay with PPP and the employee retention credit. And what our team is really darn good at is maximizing your benefit around PPP. So I mentioned we can't take the same wages for both. What the guidance provides for us is the ability to move your dollars around inside your PPP covered period. So for example, if you had a million dollar PPP loan um, and your payroll over that 24 weeks was 1.5 million, I have the ability to go in and recover 500K of payroll for the ERC. And let's say you're only gonna qualify for, you know, Q2 of 2020 or 2021, right? Um, but your covered period runs into Q3. You know, maybe we can push all of that PPP forgiveness period into Q3 um, versus Q2 when you qualify for ERC and we can max out. Um, there are different costs that qualify for PPP versus ERC. So again, we look at those things. We're always trying to get to that 10K max um, of ERC before we, before we dig into PPP dollars. Um, and then, you know, if we have to go back and scale back some ERC dollars, we do that. But uh, we're pretty darn efficient at moving the dollars around to maximize your benefit. I did mention a potential example. Um, it's Wednesday over lunch, so I made it super easy in terms of math um, for me. So if you had 100 employees and you were going to max out each of them um, with 10K in wages, they make 40K a year um, or more than that, um, maybe there's some PPP overlap, but again, we're able to work around it. Um, if you qualify for all three quarters in 21, that would be $2.1 million. Nice chunk of change. If you had 20, 20 into the mix, right? So that's $5,000 per employee, um, you know, another 50K, so, or 500K, sorry, I can't do math. Um, but anyway, it, again, it adds up quickly. All right, I will mention the guidance is available, um, but there's still a heck of a lot of gray areas. So if you have questions, you're, you're not alone in that, that regard. Um, anytime laws pulled together quickly, um, there's a lot of things that aren't thought through. I'll mention two other points that aren't on this slide. So first, the IRS is incredibly slow at opening their mail. Um, it's been in the headlines for weeks. If you're, a, if you're a tax nerd like me, you read about that kind of stuff. The COVID claims are only being processed at two IRS service centers. That's actually a good thing um, because the people are now trained and they are working through them. That said, you know, if you filed an ERC claim, you know, you can expect anywhere from four to 10 months for them to process it. We are, you know, we're telling people, you know, you should probably start to worry after nine months, but, uh, you know, before that, I, I probably wouldn't, you know, yes, you want the money and the Congress has pinged the IRS and said, hey, you need to improve this process and they are trying, um, but, uh, you know, I tell people, let's not stress until you hit that nine month mark. Um, another note is there's a lot of question out there on supply chain disruption and does that qualify me for ERC because I can't get product. Um, and I will tell you, that's to let me know if I talk too much. Um, so apparently I'm gonna run over. But uh, I will tell you that we have to tie it to a government order. Um, be just because ships are sitting off the coast of California doesn't mean you automatically qualify for ERC. Um, you really, we do have to tie it to a, a government order here. And so that can be a challenge in 2021. Um, happy to have those discussions, but just know it's an uphill battle. I was pretty impressed with uh, Jim's knowledge and use of all those acronyms. That was, that was quite, quite the acronym show. And he seemed to know what they all stood for. So nice, nice work there, Jim. 
to uh, to wrap up the the presentation part of our program today, we're, we're going to be talking about R and D tax credits. Um, I know some of you on here are pretty familiar with this. I recognize a few few names on the list that uh, have been claiming R and D credits. Probably pretty familiar from that standpoint. Um, we work with with some of some of the folks on here. Uh, for those who are not familiar, the R&D tax credit generally generally ranges between five to eight cents on the dollar of the expenses that qualify. And we'll talk about what expenses qualify here in a few minutes. Um, it's important to note that many states have a, have a significant R&D credit that in some cases can exceed the federal benefit. So a, a good example is my home state of Utah. Um, the 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 net benefit is, uh, for the Utah credit is generally about 10%. So if we add that to the federal credit, we're usually getting between 15 to 18 cents on the dollar for all of those qualified expenses. So it can add up quick and be a very nice incentive, especially when we can couple the federal credit with the state credits. There's a provision that allows us to uh, offset payroll taxes for certain startups. And we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. So I'll I'll hold off on going deeper on that. Uh, you, you may have heard the term or will hear the term, you, know, you need to do an R&D study to figure this out. What does that mean? That just means that we can, I'd Bailey or others can help go in and identify activities that qualify, identify the costs that are associated with those activities and look at all open tax years to kind of maximize the benefit. That typically includes going back to the prior three years. If you've not been claiming the credits and we're eligible, we can amend and, and take the credits for those prior three years. We have an asterisk on amending prior year returns. I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. To do some new IRS um, documentation requirements. Um, the other thing we'll note here is when you claim this R&D credit um, on the federal side, there's a carry forward of the amount. So there's a 20 year carry forward. Unlike the ERC, which is fully refundable, R&D credit um, on the federal side can only be used to offset tax, um, income tax typically, or payroll tax if you're a startup. Any credit that is not used does, does carry forward for 20 years. Um, so if you aren't in a tax paying position now, but are doing qualified activities, uh, still may be worth claiming the credit and rolling that forward to claim in the future. One thing that's not on the slide, but um, I will mention, um, when we talk about R&D incentives, we'll focus primarily on the R&D credit. There is the other incentive that's out there is the ability to currently deduct your R&D expenses. And that's been around since the 1950s, so a long time. Um, when you incur R&D costs, you can currently expense those costs instead of having to capitalize and amortize those costs over the useful life of, of the whatever's being developed. Well, that's changed at least temporarily. Um, when, when Congress passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, about five years ago now, they used that R&D amortization rule as a pay for to make to make the math look better with the with the tax cut, and they kick and they pushed it so that starting in 2022, so this year, you are no longer allowed to currently deduct your R&D expenses. Those have to be now capitalized and amortized, typically over five years. So you can still claim the R&D credit. However, your R&D expenses is, um, have to be amortized. Now, when Congress passed that rule, um, the intention was to delay it or repeal that before it ever came into effect. And that would still be the plan. For those of you who are following the Build Back Better legislation that was pretty hot and heavy right before the holidays, um, a, a delay of that amortization provision for R&D was in that bill, it, was, it would have been a four year delay. Um, Build Back Better um, didn't get passed. There's, uh, there's, this depends on who you ask, whether that's gonna be revived or, or cut up in pieces and, and certain pieces uh, passed. But I will say this, there is strong bipartisan support to eliminate or delay the effective um, R&D amortization rule. So I'd be very surprised if at some point before the end of the year, that didn't get changed retroactively and you're now allowed to continue to deduct your R&D expenses instead of having to capitalize those and amortize those. We're certainly keeping our eye on that. I know that will affect certain companies more than others, but if you're not aware of that or have that on your radar, 
I wanted to wanted to just mention that so you can start to follow that. Okay, getting getting back from that tangent, we're going to focus back on the R and D credit. So one kind of overarching concept with the R and D credit is that there's a very broad definition of R and D. Um, a lot of people hear the term R and D, and in their mind, that's someone with a white lab coat and test speaker and Bunsen burners, that sort of thing. And certainly that type of R&D will qualify, but it's, it's broader than that. It can apply to product development, processes, software, techniques, formulas, inventions, all those things can be qualified for the R&D credit. We've thrown, this is certainly not an all-inclusive list, but we've thrown out some examples for different types of activities. So on the product design and development, one thing, to, one thing to note on all of these is it's not just brand new development or design, improvements to existing products and processes and software, improvements, enhancements, improving performance, those types of things can also qualify. Um, in terms of product design, um, again, changes to products to improve reliability, to improve performance, to develop brand new products, those types of things are gonna qualify typically. On the manufacturing process side, lots of things can be pull, pulled in here. Uh, modifying your manufacturing process to incorporate automation and robotics. Um, improve your process, your production process, make it more efficient, reduce waste, improve quality. Those types of things typically qualify. Um, on the software development side, again, I'll just emphasize one more time, brand new software applications improvements, enhancements to existing software typically qualify as well. This can be applied to software companies that are developing software for lease or license or use by third parties. Um, but also in today's world, a lot of companies are investing in software development for internal use. Uh, that type of activity can also qualify. We had some regulatory changes several years ago that makes that type of software easier to qualify for the credit. Um, but if, if you're paying for or incurring uh, software costs, um, we, should, we should be talking about the R&D credit. Um, one little side note, activities need to be happening in the, in the, on US soil to qualify. So if any of like, especially like in the software world, if some of the development is happening um, off, offshore away from the United States, those particular activities and costs would not qualify, only, only costs incurred in the US. The other examples we have on here are engineer designs. We work with a lot of engineering firms, for example, that are developing and designing you know, uh, bridges and buildings and roads and that sort of thing. Uh, we, we work with, on the ag side, we work with companies that are either crop or animal um, development, um, R&D activities there. We work with uh, food companies that are doing recipes and other types of companies that are doing formulation. So a lot of, again, just emphasizes the fact that there's a pretty broad range of activities that can qualify. So what types of costs can we pull in? There's three buckets. So wages, supplies, and contract research. On the wage side, it's just important to note that it's not just the direct involvement with the person performing the R&D activity those folks that are directly supporting that person or directly supervising that person can also qualify. So it's sometimes referred to as the one level up, one level down rule where we can look at um, involvement. So a simple example would be on the software front, you've got the person that's actually writing the software code, that's typically the direct involvement. Um, direct support would often be, maybe there's someone that's in a, in a quality QA role that is involved with testing the software before it's ready for release that activity would typically be qualified direct support and includable. You also have the department manager or whoever that's supervising the person coding the software, that supervision time, as long as direct supervision can be pulled in as well. Supply costs can qualify. Um, these are typically associated with, you know, manufacturing type companies that are developing prototypes and other supplies that are used during the research and the testing process. And then if you're outsourcing any of this to a third party contractor um, that's in the US, you can pull in those contractor costs as well. I'll just touch briefly on the payroll tax offset. So I, I mentioned earlier that if you're a startup company, 
Um, typically companies that have been around for less than five years or five years or less and have less than $5 million in sales in, in the year that the credits claim. If you're, if you're not in a position where you're paying income tax, you can make an election to use the credit to offset your payroll tax on your quarterly payroll filings. Um, that, that's maxed out currently at 250,000 per year. There are several pieces of legislation out there. We'll see if any of them get passed that would enhance that and, and raise the limit on the, the maximum payroll offset per year. Documentation is king, especially in, in today's environment with the R&D credit. The Internal Revenue, or sorry, yeah, the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS is very often very aggressive with this. They see it. There's a lot of, if you haven't caught on already, there's a lot of subjectivity with the with the R&D credit. Um, and so the IRS sees it as, an, as an, an area that is kind of ripe for folks taking maybe aggressive positions on what types of activities qualify. So they put a fair amount of resources on this. So if you're gonna claim the R&D credit, you wanna make sure that your activities and the costs and the calculation and everything is properly documented. This last bullet point is important. These are brand new rules, but the IRS has decided that in order to have a valid R&D credit claim, you need to not only amend, if you, and this only applies to amended tax returns where you're claiming a refund for an R&D credit. For the longest, forever, we've, we've only we've amended those returns as a form on the, on the amended return where you claim the credit, and that's been it. Of course, you would have your documentation, substantiation, you would, you would hold in case you were audited, you could use that to support the claim. Well, the IRS has new rules um, not, they did not go through the regulatory process. They've just uh, gone a different route that some question whether it's valid, but for right now, if you're amending an R&D credit and taking a, a refund um, on your tax return, you need to submit additional documentation with that amended return. That would include things like a listing of all your projects or business components, all the people that worked on all those projects, and, the, and the, what, what's a little bit uh, makes us a little bit nervous is the IRS says you need to include all information that every person was trying to discover as part of those projects. So a pretty um, comprehensive request. We have very little guidance on what this means. We're hoping that and we've been promised the IRS is look, working on additional guidance, so more to come on this. But just keep this in mind. If, if you're thinking about amending a prior year tax return to claim a $5,000 credit, um, pro the, the, the amount of documentation the IRS is, is um, requiring now, uh, probably not worth the lift. So certainly this will come into play. You should discuss it with either I. Bailey or your tax advisor about what this means and whether it still makes sense to go back and amend. And there's certainly some strategies and more to come around this whole documentation requirement. I mentioned earlier, you know, the, what an R&D tax credit study is. Here's the approach that iBailey undertakes. We do upfront feasibility work. You know, before you're committed, we would like to make sure that it's going to work. Um, so we have a, an introductory call, talk through your fact pattern. If it does work, then we move into phase one, where we're helping to scope out the credit. And then phase two is the detail work to, to document everything, to finalize the numbers. If we're amending returns, get together the information we need to submit to the IRS, all that would be part of phase two. Um, our group also helps companies that have been claiming the credit. We do these refresh studies where we help identify, document, substantiate the credit on a year after year, year, year over year basis. Um, you know, our, our little sales pitch here is that we have a flexible approach uh, all of our clients are a little bit different. There's small, medium, and large credits. We really try to right-size the amount of work and effort and everything that goes into that to make sure that, it, that the cost-benefit makes sense, but at the same time, your credit is properly computed and documented. And we'll, we'll dive into some examples um, and everything in our breakout groups. Okay, guys, we are getting ready for some breakout rooms here. So... Um... Did have a few questions that came in. So just want to make sure we got it all because they came directly to my other computer. Okay, I sent the one question that came in to our group on the back end here so they can answer that. So we are going to move into breakout rooms. So we're going to have four breakout rooms. 
Um, one is actually going to be a general session, which is where you are right now. And that's probably our largest group. And then our second room will be the dealership room with Brittany and Matt. Then we'll have our construction room with Wade and Kristen and our manufacturing room with Joe and Jim. So what we'll do here in just a minute, we're going to open up the breakout rooms. You're going to see an icon in the middle of your screen so you can join your room. If you decide not to join, no worries, you can stay here in the main session. If I accidentally got you in the wrong session, just put it in the chat and I'll move you to the right session. No worries. And then at the end of your breakout room, feel free to drop off. And we thank you all so much for attending. So let's go ahead and open those rooms. Amy, before you drop us in real quick, yes. I saw your question. So on the ERC claims, while I don't have stats on how many have been processed, we did hear from the IRS or the firm heard from the IRS as of January 26, they had 1.1 million unprocessed 941s and another 445,000 amended 941s that were not processed. So they're working uh, as fast as they can to get through those, but they are, it's taking some time. Please note that if they they process your amended 941, right? You have an ERC claim, they process that 941. If they haven't processed your original, it's still kind of held up in the process um, until they get the original processed. So that's why that 1.1 million um, is kind of an important number. Also, we were told that they may process the return, but they're setting payments up to go out four to six weeks after after the returns are processed. So they're not cutting the checks immediately. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that delay is happening. Uh, maybe it's a secondary check, but uh, just know that they're they're doing everything they can. They're just they have quite a backlog they're trying to work through. Awesome, thank you, Jim. All right, guys, it is time for breakout rooms. So I'm gonna stop sharing. All right, so we do encourage you to turn on your camera. Please make it as interactive as you can. Feel free to unmute, ask your questions, and you do have a chat feature in each of the breakout rooms. So thank you all so much for attending and let's go ahead and open those rooms. All right, there should be an icon in the middle of your screen that will allow you to join those breakout rooms. If you opted to join the general session, you're staying right here. You won't have an option to join. So we'll give it just a second to get everyone situated and we'll start this general session. Do you guys need um, any screen share for this one? We, we may share screens, yeah. So I can probably do that if you wanna make me the presenter. Is that how that works or can anyone share screen? Um, so you have the ability right on your Zoom menu bar, click share screen and it should let you. We'll, we'll see if, how many questions there are in discussion and, and then we'll share screen if. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Looks like everyone had a pretty good time getting to their breakout room. So we're going to go ahead and start this general session. If for some reason you would not like to be in this one and go to a different one, please just chat and I'll move you over. But I'm going to turn it over to Joe and Mark and get started. Thanks, Amy. We, we really don't have an agenda for this breakout. So we're hoping that uh, the folks on here can either um, Ask questions. We, we know that we have a fairly, I'll just make a few introductory comments. Uh, based on the on the on the uh, presentation on the folks that registered, the, regist the registration list was the word that I was looking for. Um, there's a pretty wide array of representatives on here. We're seeing some folks in the healthcare industry, um, doctors, hospitals, that sort of thing. We see some folks on here that are in restaurants, hospitality. Um, higher education, um, we're seeing some of that. Other not-for-profits and government folks are probably here with us. We're seeing some software companies. I saw a couple of telecom people that had registered. Uh, I'll, I'll say professional services. We have banking, insurance, financial services, CPAs, uh, law, law firm uh, participants, retail, agriculture, a um, little bit of a uh, biotech, pharmacy, pharmaceutical, that sort of thing. So kind of runs the, the gambit, but uh, we're, we're glad that you're here. Um, between Mark and I, we can hopefully answer most of the questions you have about whether it's R&D, ERC, fixed asset services, or energy incentives. So um, who has the first question or fact pattern or anything, anything you're wondering about that we can kind of address on this breakout? 
thought we might have a little bit of a quiet group. So we'll, um, Mark, I don't know if you have any other comments, but I'll get my screen sharing so we can at least walk through some examples while people are thinking of their questions. Yeah, let's look through some case studies and maybe that'll spur some questions. So this is strange. We haven't, usually we talk and you get CPE and you're on your way. And so we're trying out this breakout session. So there's a lot of topics we talked about really superficially. So if you don't have a direct question, but just want to know about more about cost segregation, just, just type in cost segregation or type in 179D, or you want to know, hey, what's the Build Back Better Act going to look or what new tax law is out there? There's a lot of enhanced incentives that's being talked about right now in Congress, and I could talk about that for hours. So yeah, just throw out topics. And we'll go through some case studies. Mark, are you seeing my screen? I am. Hey, we, hey, we did have a couple of retailers on that were that were that were registered for registered. I'm having a hard time with that word today. Registered for this session. And I know we had an example on here of a of a retailer. Maybe maybe you could walk through how that could work. How one how one seven D could work for a, in a in a, a retail environment. Sure. And we got our first chat for ERC. So I'll be, so I'll, I'll cover the 179D and anyone who wants to know more about that, I'll, I'll try to get it, say three minutes. So 179D got made permanent in 2020. For the longest time, it was one of those tax extenders you didn't know if it was gonna be there. So now we have this as part of our tax law. So big box retailers, need to consider this every year because it's a per square foot deduction. And so the more square feet, the better. And big box retailers, of course, tons of square footage and tons to qualify for. Now, the exciting thing about 179D is not only is it permanent, but they're talking about upping the deduction from a buck 80 per square foot to $5 per square foot. So all of a sudden, what was material to begin with is now really material when you add up the square footage of your, um, of your retail. I will say this, for the current state we're in right now, the $1.80 threshold, the energy requirements are super low. The tax code has not caught up with the building code. Said another way, of the hundreds that we've done 179D studies, we are averaging $1.78 per square foot out of the buck 80. We're pretty much batting a thousand um, to get the full buck 80 per square foot. So this is not an incentive where uh, you have to be lead certified, gold, platinum, or you gotta do a lot of energy things you're following building code and building up these big boxes or anything for that matter, chances are you have a good shot here to claim this deduction. From a big box point of view, you're able to retroactively go back and look at your portfolio. I would say the vetting is how much square footage do you have? Multiply by $1.80 square footage since 2006. Multiply by $1.80. That's probably your max deduction that you're available for that you can get. And things can dramatically change to that $5 um, a square foot in the future. I will say this about the $5 a square foot though. If they put out that carrot, uh, rest assured they'll up the energy efficiency that you have to meet. But really, again, especially in the big box retail space, we're seeing a lot of companies buy into this environmental sustainability and governance. A lot of companies are building high bay LED lightings, LED lights in their big box stores. So it's really something that now that it's permanent needs to be embedded into the fixed asset um, capitalization policy. You could just grab this deduction as you're building them, just like you would any other deduction or incentive. All right, that was my three minutes. So I see we have two chats. 
Yeah, maybe before we go there, Mark. So any any follow-up questions on 170D? Because I think we're going to switch gears and talk about ERC here in a minute. So anything else anyone wants to to dive deeper on 179D questions, comments around that? Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, we've got some ERC um, questions. Let's see, I'm trying to get, okay. Um, so one, the one question I'm seeing in the chat is, is it's kind of this whole ERC PPP interplay that Jim talked about. And the question is, if I'm able to use one month of wages, um, in, like for example, uh, second quarter, and that needs to go to PPP. Um, can I use other months um, for ERC? I think Robert, that's that's the question you're asking, uh, or maybe that's the other way around. But uh, either way, if one month has to go towards PPP, can you use your other two months for ERC? And the the question, the answer is the short answer is yes. And let me explain a little bit more about that. You're allowed to take both an ERC credit and as well as apply um, the wages paid to the same employees to PPP. So you, it's not like you have to say, well, this particular employee I'm only using for PPP or this other one only for ERC. You're allowed to take wages paid to the same person for both programs. You just can't double dip on the same dollars. So if you pay $1 of wages, we have to figure out, is that gonna, we're gonna allocate that. And so, okay, does that go into my, PPP or my ERC bucket. By the way, there's other, other buckets too. I mean, there's the paid family and sick leave, the FFCRA credits. Um, it can go towards that. Uh, you can go toward an R&D credit, for example, but you can't, you've got to basically pick your bucket that you want to allocate those wages to. But you, we are allowed to do those allocations in the most favorable manner possible. So one, and Jim talked about this kind of at a high level, but when we're looking at doing that PPP ERC allocation, we're going, we, want to, we want to maximize it. So oftentimes, and if you're, if you're still working on your 2021 PPP forgiveness, the strategy would be to use the longest possible covered period, um, 24 weeks, and also use as many non-payroll costs on your PPP application as possible. And that really gives us the maximum flexibility as we do that allocation. Um, because even if, let's say your PPP uh, two loan in 2021 was only, let's say $200,000, um, but you, during that 24 week covered period, let's say you paid your employees, you, know, you had wages of $500,000. And let's say all of those wages were reported on your PPP app uh, forgiveness application. That's okay. We can take the excess wages, that $300,000 that you didn't need to maximize forgiveness we can then apply that in the, towards ERC. But even better, if you had reported some non-payroll costs, um, rent, utilities, that sort of thing, we can then take, you, you'll need less wages of that 500,000, less will have to go towards uh, PPP. Up to 40% of your PPP could go to these non-payroll costs. That would free up even more wages to go towards ERC. So what we'll typically do is kind of look not just month by month, Robert, we'll look kind of pay period by pay period. We want to, we want to make sure we don't jeopardize your PPP forgiveness. So we'll make sure that's all, that's all satisfied first. And then, and then take any additional or extra wages and allocate that towards ERC. Hopefully that makes sense. It's kind of hard to explain in words, uh, but that's kind of how, how, how we do it. Um, Amy, you mentioned there's some additional discussion around ERC requirements for 21. I don't know if I see any specific questions or if anyone wants to. It was just a generic statement, okay. so. Okay. So that, uh, well, let me pause. Uh, if anyone wants to volunteer a specific question or I can, I can just kind of talk some more about ERC in 21, if that would be helpful. Go through our examples too. Let's, let's maybe hit on some of these examples a little bit. Um, we've, we've done quite a bit of ERC work in the healthcare environment. Um, in terms of government orders and shutdowns, that sort of thing, the most common and easiest thing to qualify in 2020 was a lot of states had restrictions on um, you know, elective procedures or non-urgent procedures. 
So hospitals and other types of healthcare providers were, were prohibited from doing that for a certain amount of time to, in order to preserve the PPE, the, the protective equipment. Um, that would, in almost all cases, constitute a government order. And therefore, those companies, um, those healthcare entities would qualify um, for the ERC. Um, now, we're not seeing a ton of government orders in 21 that we can point to. However, um, we're still seeing examples where certain healthcare practices were down 20% in revenues. And remember, this is an either or test. So we have an example up here of a pediatrician uh, that was down more than 20% in Q1 uh, in 2021 compared to 19. As a result, they also qualified for Q2. Remember, we can look, so if you qualify for Q1 based on gross receipts, you're going to automatically qualify for Q2. So we took both quarters um, over a 5,000, you know, over a million dollars of credit in this example um, based on that 20% decline and a relative, you know, 130 employees. We're not talking about a huge company here, but these, like, like Jim kind of illustrated, these dollars can add up really quick. Um, we worked with an, uh, I'll just again kind of walk through these examples, uh, worked with an advertising uh, company. Um, again, gross receipt qualifier. So they were down 20% uh, in Q1, uh, similar to our pediatrician example that automatically qualified them for Q2 as well. You'll see similar amounts of credits, almost a million dollars of, of credits. Um, you'll see on this one, the kind of the note on here about the PPP overlap. And so this, this company had, had a PPP2 loan. We were limited. There was you know, more of the covered period for this particular company landed in Q2. So we had to take more wages that were paid and apply that to PPP2. So that's why you'll see a difference in the, even though they had a similar headcount, similar wages in Q1 and Q2, the credit was lower in Q2 due to that PPP overlap. Now in this case, their, their covered period went into Q3 and they weren't ERC eligible in Q3. So we first took as many wages as we could in, Q in Q3 uh, before we dipped into the Q2 wages, if that makes sense. We might have, Jim talked about restaurants. We are helping a lot of restaurants. I know there was a few uh, registrants for this um, session that were restaurant hospitality. Um, we are seeing a lot of government orders, uh, restrictions on, on operations, mostly to do with dining rooms. Um, if dining rooms were closed or limited capacity or tables had to be more than six feet apart or six feet apart, that sort of thing, we'll typically be able to use that to qualify under the government orders test. We're also seeing a lot of restaurants, um, depending on where they're at and what type of restaurant, uh, that were down 20% in, 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 in 21. So we're seeing that this particular example uh, had a nice credit in 2020 due to the government shutdown. Um, but also in 21 due to the gross receipts decline. So 55 employees and $350,000 of, well, more than that, because we qualified, I think, um, two quarters. So um, over $500,000 of, of credits combined. Those are our ERC examples. I was going to look at my list. Uh, Jim alluded to this, but I, I know we have some folks on here that are in the government, not-for-profit, uh, education space. Um, most, we've, we've seen this, a lot of higher ed um, in 2020 did not, if they're gov you know, government, um, public universities, public colleges did not qualify for ERC in 2020. So uh, a lot of colleges, universities just figured they didn't qualify for ERC. That rule was changed, and we've had we're, we're helping a handful of public universities, colleges um, qualify for ERC in 21, and that can be had up to significant dollars. So I wanted to kind of point that out uh, in the ERC context. Um, what else are we seeing? Oh, I should just mention not for profits. You know, a lot of especially in 2020, a lot of government orders. If you're into, you know arts and, and that sort of thing, um, different types of, obviously lots of different types of not-for-profits out there, but we, we, it was not, not unusual at all to have government restrictions on operations for not-for-profits in, in 2020. As we get into 21, um, 
we've got a client that operates a, a social club, you know, they're a not-for-profit entity, their, their revenues were down, they have a restaurant, they have a hotel, they have different things, um, so we're able to qualify them under the, under the revenue decline test, so all kinds of fact patterns running into, uh, I'm, now I'm just kind of uh, yammering on and on, so I'll, I'll pause there, hopefully, um, if you're wondering about ERC, I was able to provide a little bit more color on what types of things can qualify and, and the whole PPP ERC interplay. But any, any additional questions anyone has about ERC, anything you're wondering about? We have one person to unmute and, and ask a question. All right. They just all have so many questions, they don't know where to start. <laughs> All right, guys, feel free, please, to use the chat. You can mute, unmute. This is your time, and we love to answer any questions we can, even if it's really generic because you're not sure how to ask it. No worries. No, it's weird talking to the people on TV, <laughs> but you can do it. Uh, I, I'll, I'll start talking, but the minute we get a question, I'll, I'll stop. So ERC is definitely the flavor of the month or the year of the last two years and it, it's material and, it, and it's a it's a big deal i predict um this climate incentives will start to become more of a bigger deal in 22 and 23 and so if you want to get ahead of it right now a lot of this climate stuff is attached to the build back better act which six months ago seemed like a good idea. Right now, it doesn't seem like a good idea. And there's maneuvering now, and I'm sure you've seen the news, Joe Manchin, and maybe decoupling the climate, the 500 you know, plus of incentives that are in that and putting it somewhere else, getting bipartisan support, who knows what's gonna look like, but climate is going to be addressed. Things like 45Q, carbon capture, need to be addressed. Environmental, sustainable, and governance, ESG, is be, going to become part of our lingo. And by the way, the 179D and the 45L that Sawatsky talked about are both considered building certifications that qualify under the E, environmental, of that ESG. And so tax departments are going to start to have to contribute. Stakeholders are going to say, hey, how can you contribute to our ESG efforts? How can you contribute? And tenants and lessors are going to start to look for the energy, maybe not some of the energy star, but the ESG initiatives in their buildings. And so I guess we're in a wait and see. But when it comes to the 45L residential credit and the 179D deduction, it's there now and can be used. And to the extent that you even think that you might qualify for some of these incentives, I would highly encourage to get an assessment. And the assessments that we do are completely free of charge. It starts with a discovery call where we have a 30 minute call. And we just talk about energy incentives and your fact pattern. Maybe that's a better form than this call right now where everyone's on. We can talk specifically about what's going on and is there something there for you, not just in the past, but going forward? So climate, it's not ERC, but I know it might get there in the next couple of years. I agree. So I think it'd be really funny if someone asked an ERC question right now. Not sure that. We don't need to take this to the, to the full 30 minutes, but I did want to just touch, touch on R&D for a minute, um, just a case study. So when I looked at our folks that are in this breakout, um, the most applicable area of R&D for most of you, if, it, if, it, if anything, um, now if you're not for profit or government or higher ed, you know, you're not going to be able to claim the R&D credit. Um, I can claim it, but there's no, no tax, no income tax to offset. Um, but for the others, um, software development will be the most common um, thing we would look at. So I kind of alluded to this in my presentation, but you know, in today's world, 
we're working with insurance companies that are developing software and banking and retail and every all, all types of companies are investing in software development. So as you're kind of thinking through uh, your IT spend, is that all just implementing, buying off the shelf solutions? Um, or is there some spend to internally develop anything or significant modification or integration costs can potentially qualify as well. So if you're not in a traditional, and I know we have some software companies on here too, but um, outside of that environment, if you're looking at R&D credits, just think through the software spend. And if, if there's a significant amount there, I know that's kind of a fuzzy term. If you spent more than $100,000 on, on software development or improving, enhancing, customizing software, it's probably worth a discussion to see if there might be some some benefit there. I threw up an example on here um, that you can you can kind of read through, but uh, we can typically find some good dollars. And uh, and Mark, I'll, I wasn't surprised we had another ERC question, so we'll, we'll pull it back to that. Um, does ERC apply only to C corps? The, and the answer there is no. All types of entities um, can qualify for ERC. So we're looking at partnerships, S corps, LLCs, sole proprietorships. Um, now, the one thing there is you, you, we, cannot, we cannot claim the ERC for owner's wages or for their family members. So if you've got a, a closely held family business that ever, all the employees are, are, are family members, including in-laws of the owner, you're not gonna have much if any ERC, but uh, there's no entity limitation. Um, and, and the way that, again, we will talk about this again, but the way this is claimed is by amending your payroll tax returns. So you have to have payroll or you wouldn't qualify for ERC and then we'd, we would amend those returns to claim the credit. But uh, great question. How does ERC show on the income statements? Um, so great, great question. Uh, I knew that I would get a curveball that I, I'll, probably, I'll probably fumble the answer here a little bit. Um, but the uh, first off, the ERC, when you claim the ERC, it is added back um, for, in, for income tax purposes. So if you claim a $500,000 ERC on your payroll tax returns, you have to reduce your otherwise allowable deductions by that amount. So you're going to show that on your income tax return. Um, from an income statement standpoint, um, there's, I, don't think there's, I don't know if there's one way that, that uh, on, on, your, on the financial that this is being um, shown, is it, you know, is it a, a credit? It's, it's a tax credit, right? So is it coming in as additional income? Is it being treated um, as a credit? I guess there's no set way to do it. So I'm kind of dancing around this uh, issue because I don't have an example I can just illustrate, but uh, it definitely needs to come into play. The other, the other thing about the timing, right? Um, is, it, is it recognized in the year you earn the credit or, or later? Um, in most cases, it would be the year that it's earned. Um, what do the studies typically cost for the R&D tax credit? So I mentioned earlier about, sorry, switching gears here again. Um, we wanna make sure the cost benefit makes sense. Um, we do not do contingent fees. Um, so it's not just a straight percentage. However, so that you know what to expect, um, the cost to do an, an R&D study is typically going to be about 20 to 25% of the net benefit. So if we if we can save you $100,000 of cash to go in and do the analysis, put the substantiation together, everything we're looking to 20, 25,000 would be typically the range we would be in on that type of a thing. Mark, any last comments of wisdom? Thanks for everyone's time. And we will be in touch um, post uh, I know that a lot of you are clients of ours and, and even those who are not, we'll, we'll be in touch with discovery calls and assessments to follow up to make sure you're capturing all the cash flow you want. Thanks, everybody. All right, everyone. Well, the general session is over and we do have just one breakout room going, so I'm going to leave this um, webinar up and running, but please feel free to drop off. We thank you all so much for attending. Thank you for our questions. Thank you to our awesome presenters. Have a great day, guys. Mm -hmm.